It's Friday night. Let's talk about getting wasted, as in how many doses of vaccine are not able to be used. Great news. Not many in our state. A Coloradan who thinks and writes about racism has words that will stop and make us listen. And we'll introduce you to a team whose word choices become Colorado's laws. You don't elect them, though you get to meet them tonight. And we will share your words and mine about marking one year since we first sat down in front of this fireplace. Come on in. From my home to yours, a year after your first visit, this is next. Colorado's largest vaccine phase yet has opened today. And if you'll allow a local newscast to start with a double dose of positive news, Colorado's vaccine providers are doing a really good job of making sure that vaccine doses don't go to waste. Here's Our health care providers have been treating these vaccines like liquid gold, which helps explain what five big health systems told us about avoiding waste. We're talking UC Health that's now distributing around 40,000 doses a week and reported not being able to use two doses so far, one of which was accidentally dropped. Kaiser says that it couldn't use roughly 300 doses they've received so far. That's out of more than 150,000 doses they've given Coloradans. Health One says they've had very little waste except for one broken syringe with one dose. Denver Health says they haven't wasted any so far. SEL Health is following a similar pattern and says if they couldn't administer a dose, it's because they weren't able to get someone in fast enough before the vial or syringe expired. From a statewide perspective, the total number of doses that could not be given in Colorado as of yesterday is 838 reported to the Department of Health. That was because of issues with storage or power outages, a vial being dropped or a faulty syringe or needle. The hospital systems are not messing around. They each have programs to reach out to people on wait lists for leftover doses. And SEL Health has a list of people within 15 minutes that can potentially drop what they're doing to get a shot last minute. So just remember those numbers I just talked about. That's out of more than 2 million doses that have been distributed in Colorado so far. Just a little bit more about Kaiser and the numbers you saw there. More than half of the doses they found that was unusable actually happened in one go earlier this year because of a power outage. Another big one was in southern Colorado. It was 300 doses. Again, Kyle, that's because there was a malfunction with the storage unit and they couldn't use those doses. Anusha, I imagine in rural Colorado, they don't have as many people nearby that they can call in to make sure they don't waste doses at the end of the day, but they probably know just about everybody in town. Yeah, and so there's actually this hospital, Lincoln Community Hospital, that we've been in touch with uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, they're in Hugo, Colorado, and I asked them, how have things been going, and have you had to waste any doses? I got an email, Kyle, back with one number, and it said zero. They have used everything that's come their way. That is awesome. All right, Anusha Roy has you on weekend mornings, Saturday and Sunday. Thank you, Anusha. 14.2% of Coloradans have their final vaccine shot. They're all set. That is 817,000 people. More than 488,000 of our neighbors are waiting on a second shot of Moderna or Pfizer. And you got to remember, 20% of the state population can't be vaccinated because they're too young to qualify at any point. 331 Coloradans are currently hospitalized with COVID-19, down six patients from the day before, but we have seen a week-over-week -week increase. We've got about two dozen more patients than we did last Friday. Dr. Jennifer Ho's words have captured America's attention in the days following the shootings near Atlanta that left eight people dead, including six Asian women. Dr. Ho is an anti-racism educator at the University of Colorado Boulder. Here is her view of this moment in American history. These kids are gunshot and, you know, the ladies passed out, like, from the door. Do I think that he racially targeted Asian women? I absolutely believe that he racially targeted Asian women. And I know this because he went into businesses and places where Asian women were, and he shot them. It was heartbreaking and it wasn't surprising. And the reason it wasn't surprising is that I've been waiting for this to happen. And I have no pleasure at all saying that. When I say I've been waiting for this to happen, what I mean is, as an Asian American studies scholar who knows Asian American history, I know the way that Asians are vulnerable, have always been vulnerable in the United States, and that because of yellow peril rhetoric and the way that Asians have been subject to white supremacy and violence, that this was bound to happen. 
I'm Jennifer Ho, Professor of Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I also direct the Center for Humanities and the Arts, and I'm the current president of the Association for Asian American Studies. A CNN editor contacted me asking if I would be free to write an editorial related to the Atlanta shootings. I wrote about my real experiences in the U.S. South when I used to live in Chapel Hill, and that included the ways that white male veterans would oftentimes stop me, ask me if I was Korean or Vietnamese, and then proceed to share their wartime stories with me. Sometimes talking through their trauma, sometimes making not so much veiled sexual innuendo about the women they met who looked like me and the kind of fun that they used to have during the war. Anti-racism is a choice. So if anyone is upset about the anti-Asian racism, the anti-black racism, racism against Latinx and indigenous people, you can choose to do something because anti-racism, like racism, isn't an identity category. It's the choices we make. Dr. Ho's view has been met with the predictable vile stuff, so she's closed off some of her social media for a while, and her email auto-reply from the university warns people that she will be reporting their threats. Colorado's recovery from the economic pandemic is going faster than expected. State legislators got two budget updates. One was from their own nonpartisan staff. The other came from Democratic Governor Jared Polis's office. The governor's team is suggesting that things are going better for more people than the nonpartisan report would indicate. I want to show you some info from the nonpartisan legislative staff. It shows that high income earners, qualified as people who make $60,000 a year or more, have more job opportunities than one year ago in Colorado. Low income workers, those who make $27,000 or less, the opposite. 30% fewer jobs in a year. Compare that slide to what the governor's office showed the same state legislators. His budget team paints a far rosier picture for middle and low income workers in our state. We asked the governor's office why there is such a discrepancy, and we are still waiting to hear back. I got a note from a next viewer this week who grew up in the foster care system. She talked about how scary it was to suddenly be on her own at the age of 18. She wrote, the fear that comes from being uneducated is paralyzing. She said, if this program prevents one kid from having the experience I did, then their job is done. That program she's talking about is the Matthews House in Northern Colorado, your word of thanks microgiving project this week. The Matthews House's many services include academic support for at-risk kids in high school to ensure that they have the guidance to get through school and graduate if their families aren't able to provide it. You have raised more than $35,000 to support their work this week. If you want to text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, I'll send you that link to join a bunch of good people in donating. You will have my thanks. You will have the thanks of that viewer who wrote in, who lived these challenges, and who knows the importance of what the Matthews House does. We're the, the people who care about the coordinating conjunctions. What's their function? Writing the words that change life in Colorado. You don't know them, but they have a big impact on our lives. So let's get acquainted next. In a lot of stories, we'll say there's a bill at the state capitol. In reality, there's a Christie at the state capitol and an Ed, a Jane, a Conrad, Alana, and Jennifer. All the names of people writing the bills that make the news. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger shows you the unusually perfect way those bills are crafted. Crossed out text and corrections in capital letters. This is not an essay that got an F. This is grade A bill writing by Ed DiCecco. You know, a lot of people, this is their dream job, but it wasn't actually for me. 20 years later, Ed still writes bills as an attorney for the Office of Legislative Legal Services. We always try to draft stuff in plain language and hope that 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 bill will be able to, someone can read it and know exactly what it does. You might not know him by name or face, but you know his work. 
He wrote the 43-page bill that passed the legislature, then showed up on your 2020 ballot as one long paragraph, Proposition EE, the cigarette and nicotine tax. All 100 members of the General Assembly have to come through our office for any legislation that they want to introduce each session. Christy Chase is also one of the wizards behind the legislative legal services curtain. One of the big things that we do with a lot of legislation is trying to get the law to catch up. Telehealth is an example. A bill introduced two weeks ago, I mean, a bill written by Richard introduced introduced two weeks ago, defines telemedicine in Colorado law. For bills that bring Colorado laws into the 21st century, it's amazing the technology used is far from 21st century. I hate to admit this, we use word perfect, so. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I think we're in the 19th century with that. Let me save you from searching what is word perfect. It's not word, and those of us who used to use it might not call it perfect. It works really well with our bills and the way we, we draft them. To keep the words capitalized and crossed out throughout the bill's life, from introduction to changes to final votes, the program is apparently perfect. That requires special codes for that to stay in the bill throughout the process. And Word Perfect is the way that works best for us right now. Much to the chagrin of the rest of the world. <laughs> No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We're the, the people who care about the coordinating conjunctions. And and or are coordinating conjunctions. And mistaking one for or the other could change the meaning of a law. Do you need to meet all the criteria? In which case, that whole list needs to be connected by an and. Or you just need to meet one or a few of them, then it's connected by an or. Words. Shall and may. Oh, for oh, sure. Perfect. Let's talk quickly how Timothy shall and may could also derail a bill. Shall means mandatory, like you have to fund a program. May means perhaps. I asked why we can't use words like have to and perhaps in a law, and I got laughed out of the room, Kyle. <laughs> that was some good, clean, nerdy political fun. Thank you, Marshall. quiet across the country. We do have a couple of small systems off to the west and northwest, but across Colorado we've had nice sunny skies all afternoon, maybe a couple high thin clouds, but overall we've enjoyed a nice mostly sunny Friday and overnight tonight we do stay mostly clear to partly cloudy. Early Saturday morning, those cloud cover, the light cloud cover that we have continues to make its way out. And then later this evening we'll see those overnight lows near 33 degrees calm and mild. The rest of the state will see those overnight temperatures Temperatures mostly in the 30s, 20s, some areas even in the 40s, a little further southeast, colder in the high country. Then the next couple of days, we see warmer weather Saturday before cool down Sunday. Our Friday good news is a 60 degree day after a historic blizzard, and that is just the start of the spring like outlook in your lives. And hey, that looks familiar. Can you believe it has been one year of gathering together by this fireplace? A word about what we've shared here and this era inevitably coming to an end. Next. March 19th, 2020, one year ago tonight, we had our first fireside chat here. Never did guess that we would have hundreds more. It's been a year. Ha happy basement anniversary, everybody. A year ago today, we were all being asked to consider if we could do some or all of our jobs from home for a while to slow the spread of COVID-19 as cases were beginning to rise in Colorado and around the country. I am here for the same reason that a lot of you are working from home. Because everyone from epidemiologist to the president insists that if you can do some or all of your job at home, you should. Because social distancing saves lives. Weld County's health director was saying the other day that every single contact that we can avoid matters. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing game. The choices that we make matter because they have the opportunity to slow down the coronavirus. So maybe tell your boss, if Nine News can set up a home studio to broadcast live, maybe you could just take your laptop home and get plenty of work done. Year ago tonight, I invited you into my home for the first time, noting that it was about time that I returned the favor that you've extended me nightly for years. We have sat down here together each weeknight since and had some pretty rough conversations along the way about life and loss, about frustration and confusion, 
We've also sat here together and talked about community and recovery, about resilience and hope. We've laughed a lot together during a miserable year. And somewhere along the line, a lot of you started to tell us that you didn't just appreciate these conversations, but you also liked this place. A viewer named Gene made a next woodpile cake to mark one year here. And the, the note with this, let me read a bit of this to you. To me, Gene wrote, the woodpile represents connection. You found a way to stay connected to us, and in turn, you gave us all a way to stay connected with each other. Gene went on to write, When I see the woodpile, I feel a sense of reassurance. When COVID-19 first hit, we were all scared and looking for answers. Gene wrote, No matter how bad things got outside the walls of our home, my husband and I knew we could turn on next, and for 30 minutes or so each night, things seemed a little more okay. That means the world to all of us on the next team to hear you say that. This place where we gather nightly to talk will be around for a while, but not forever. It was not meant to be forever. We'll carry that connection, that sense of reassurance with us when we go. Fridays are for your good news for 241 consecutive Fridays now. Each is also a bit of a marker on whatever is happening in the community that week. The 240th edition last week found people thinking positive while bracing for a snowstorm. This 241st edition is pure sunshine. When the sun comes out, it's okay. Things are good. Denver cleaned up. We got rid of our nice job. Yeah, yeah. They cleaned it up, and it's oh, easy to get around. That's great. Uh, I'm Rich. This is Linda. And that's Harrison. And that's Harrison. Well, this is kind of one of our many afternoon walks that we take, and we like to come down here and grab a coffee. So our good news is that our kids are in town and that we've gotten to visit with them yeah. because they had moved away six months ago. So yeah. that's our good news. Yeah. My name is Ariel. I'm here visiting from North Carolina. My name is Ashley. I live in Broomfield and I've been here for about a year. I just got accepted into grad school. So, really excited. Going for a master's in folklore. Shout out. Yeah. And I just closed on a house in Thornton. So, first time home buyer. Woo the whole process was just nerve wracking. Is it going to fall through at any moment? And then we finally closed and. Yeah, I guess we're homeowners now, my boyfriend and I. But I'm excited. I'm ready to not be like, I'm ready to be like official adults. So they're going to have to put some respect on my name because I'm like <laughs> official out same. here. I feel like I leveled up. Yeah, like, like no, like... they can't approach me the same because I'm like, I am an adult. It's a, it's a guaranteed smile every week, every time. We return with a sign that the real snowmageddon begins when the temperatures hit 60. That and your feedback next. It's a sign that spring is coming and the day is bright and full of terrors. The snowman that Paul spotted at 14th and Knox is desperately trying to warn us. The end is nigh. I laughed out loud when this landed in our inbox. I don't know why. Like, I drew attention to myself. I was laughing so hard at this. If you see a sign that you want to share with us, email it to next at 9news.com. Use the hashtag HeyNext on Twitter. The recipe for Gene's next cake is on the next section of 9news.com. Gene really appears to know what she's doing. I bet you the cake would be delicious if you made it. I'm sure there are some San Diego State fans in our audience. I wish you lots of luck tonight, just not as much as I wish the Syracuse Orange. See you next time.